Have you ever been told to give to get, pay to play, or take a risk before you can experience a gain? Today, we're going to be talking about follow the money. You are listening to Wealth Talks with the McFees. We're back in the studio today. And you know, these uh, these cliches that you got to give to get, pay to play, risk before gain, they have some truth to them because you do have to put wood in the in the furnace before you can expect heat from a fire. And so this has a root in reality, and yet so often these cliches are used or these ty- this type of reasoning is used to raise money for uh, on false pretenses as well. And so we have to be wise when we, uh, when we hear different things and put it into the correct context. And my question is, raise money for who, John? Raise money for who? <laughs> raise money for what? <laughs> and, and these cliches, they can be inappropriately applied. Absolutely. And isn't that the isn't that the case with any type of truth? Any type of truth when it's true in one area can be twisted and turned to a nefarious purpose as well. Ah, absolutely. I can't help but think of all the bank failures that are happening right now and how these uh, banks that have fallen in, in the last few weeks, like Silicon Valley Bank and yesterday the First uh, Republic Bank and, you know, Signature Bank, they were playing with the large um, uh, millionaires, billionaires of the world, giving them really low interest rates on huge mortgages. They were uh, giving them um, nice savings rates so they would put lots of money way beyond what the FDIC could insure or would insure to sell them packages for brokerages and services and for um, uh, business finance management. Yeah, in investment and business stuff, basically. Yeah. And so That's they, where were, they were making their real money. And, and, and so when someone came to um, get their money out of the bank, oh, there was no money there. Mm. It, was, uh, it was devastating. And, it, and it's having a rippling effect today because uh, those type of attitudes where you've got to play to play, Uh, pay to play and whatnot, can really um, upset the financial market. And so today we open the papers and there's 19 regional banks after First Republic Bank collapses that are now have lost up to 45% of their stock value. Hey, and Tom, you just gave us away because you were mentioning the bank failure as of yesterday. And now you're talking about what's in the paper today. And you listeners are (laughs) listening at a later date than uh, today. (laughs) So... (laughs) Um, yeah, we are recording this, um, and it'll be you know a little while before it gets out. So who knows what's going to be in the news between now and then? But uh, yes, we see this trend, these problems with the banks, and you know Solomon in the Bible said no, there's nothing new under the sun. So we've seen things like this before, and there are lessons to be learned. We can learn lessons from what's happening right now. We can also look at past history and learn lessons. Yeah. And so returning to our theme for today of following the money, you can follow the money in finance, like you did with these banks, and we're going to talk about some examples of that. You can follow the money in politics and in religion oftentimes as well. You know, follow the money, and it tells you a lot about what's going on behind the scenes, even when it's just in the name of politics or in the name of religion. Uh, the money is still an important element in the equation of what's really happening. And you can follow the money in uh, the pharmaceutical industry and the healthcare oh. industry and every industry out there. So we need to be as wise as serpents, Jesus told us, and innocent as doves. So we really need to be careful by just believing everything we've say, we hear about finances, health, um, you know, whatever it is, we need to check it out. And I think of how the Bereans in Scripture were, were um, praised for diligently listening to Paul when he taught them from the Scriptures about the Christ and what was happening. But they went home and they diligently searched out the matter to make sure it was right. They didn't mm-hmm. disbelieve someone even as great as Paul. Yeah. That's right. And we have to do the same as we learn about things today. You know, talking about the... Um, following the money in the, in the terms of all these bank failures. If we go back to 2008, uh, Washington Mutual had problems in 2008, and so did, uh, I think it was Baron Stearns. And Countrywide and, and some other, yeah, other and, financial. And so so those, those two specifically, Washington Mutual and Baron, Bear Stearns, uh, J.P. Morgan came in and bought those out in the wake of the banking crisis in 2008. What did they buy, though, John? They didn't buy their liabilities. They only bought their assets. Mm. This poses a huge transfer of wealth. 
Because if nobody's buying the liabilities, who has to step in and take care of them? Yeah, the the, uh, the government is what who's <laughs> stepping in to take care of it if if the depositors aren't going to bear the share of it. And, of course, and, the investors suffer as well, the investors and well, the stock. Well, and when we, we talk about – I'm sorry, John, I didn't mean to talk over you. The When we're talking about the government coming in to step in and take over, uh, the government has no money of their own. So where is that money coming from but from the pockets of the taxpayer? It's That's coming right. from you and me. It came from somebody else to begin with. The government right. can just transfer the wealth. Mm-hmm. They don't and, create it. And that 2008 debacle cost American taxpayers $16.8 trillion dollars that's coming out of your pocket. That's coming out of my pocket. That's coming out of everybody's pocket that works in this country. How much was that? Sixteen point eight trillion. That's wow. what the government pledged, according to Forbes. And uh, and yet, who got all the assets? The yeah. bank that took them over. The banks that took yeah. them over. So so let's take a look at this. You know, in the case of First Republic Bank, we see J.P. Morgan stepping in again. This time, they waited, of course, till the regulators had come in first, though, because First Republic had been trying to find a buyer for a while. And it turns out, I guess they didn't have a lot of interest until the regulators were, were willing to step in and say, hey, we'll help you cover some of the liabilities on this. And then J.P. Morgan was happy to snap up First Republic Bank. So I was reading about that this morning. You know, J.P. Morgan now manages over three trillion dollars. Of, uh, of assets, they have over 10% of the market share in deposits in the United States. Mm. Wow, so that's normally, a lot of control. A lot of control just at this one bank now. And so normally, because uh, because they're over that 10% mark, they would not be allowed to acquire a bank like First Republic unless it was in trouble like this and they're stepping in to save the system. Oh, dear. Um, so what exactly did J.P. Morgan acquire with this deal, though? They acquired the... Uh, All the, the deposits. They, they acquired the deposits that were left, which, of course, <laughs> had suffered significantly. They acquired the uh, the investment clients, which the is investment huge. advisory side of the First Republic. That's, remember, where First Republic Bank was making their real money. And... They acquired some of the liabilities, too. They are going to have to to work with the liabilities, but the FDIC is going to share that responsibility with them. They're saying that they're going to share that. It's, it's going to cost the, uh, the FDIC fund about $13 billion is the figure that I saw today. And, of course, the FDIC is backed up by the full guarantee of the United States government treasury, which is the American taxpayer. Yeah. Now, now, it's interesting here that the FDIC is stepping in to share in these losses because normally the FDIC is supposed to help um, you know, cover the depositors. But in the case of First Republic, in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, remember they had catered to these wealthy uh, clients to deposit large sums of money. And so many of their deposits were uninsured by the FDIC. It was over that 250000 per client limit. And so to see the, to see how this is working out where you know, many depositors did pull their money when they saw that First Republic was having trouble, but to see the FDIC stepping in anyway? Sounds why, like why, bailing why out student loans, people why, that don't want to pay it back, or marking down uh, you know, the interest rate for people that have poor credit. They're, they're, I mean, these are things that government are doing that are just foolish. And, and John, it was very fascinating. The FDIC failed in their duty for regulating these banks in the first place. They admit that. If yeah, we read deeply, regulators. they made reports but didn't follow up on, the, on making sure that th- those necessary corrections were made so these banks did fail because they were following bad protocol. Mm. Oh. Yeah. A lot of ingredients <laughs> go in to make, a, to make a sorry story, don't they? And I think we need to talk about how a bank actually even gets its charter in the first place. You know, They can't get a charter unless they go through the FDIC, the Comptroller of the United States Currency, and the Federal Reserve Bank. Those three, those three institutions are what give a bank its authority to open. And yet the FDIC felt us. The Federal Reserve keeps raising interest rates, which triggered this bank run, okay? And, you know, I I haven't heard what the comptroller is doing of the currency, but this is government failure. Improperly regulating the institutions they've set up to protect the consumer, us, and that is really, um, that's really a sad scenario. Same thing happened in 2008, 
So yeah. here we are. I feel like I'm I'm sitting here. We've been talking about all these problems. I feel like I'm wounded and bleeding. So now, is is there a solution? Or are you going to first put some rub <laughs> some salt into these wounds I have here? Well, there is a solution. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about this. And and that's the solution that Nelson Nash realized years and years ago, when he said. We need to become our own bank. Well, and he wrote the book, Becoming Your Own Banker, and he is kind of considered the father of the infinite banking concept, where he talked about how we can become our own banker, kind of set up our bank. So, yeah, tell us more about that. Well, you know, we talked about how the bank is set up, and and, and insurance companies, life insurance companies, go through a similar process, only it's on a state level rather than a federal level. So they have to get the insurance commission's approval. They have to get the controller of the currency of the state, the comptroller, to say, yeah, you can start this charter. And they also have to be willing to contribute to the guarantee funds that are nonprofit organizations in every state, which insure a policyholder up to $300,000, which is $50,000 more than the FDIC will. The nice thing about that is that guarantee fund and every state is a nonprofit, non-regulated institution. And so we're getting away from government control here because it's centralization. It's this collective idea, it's this socialist idea that one person in Washington or an institution in Washington can regulate all these banks. No, it needs to be on the local level. And so Mr. Nash realized that, oh, this is a much closer to home type thing that we can control. And so the insurance company goes through all that, and we can tap into that without having to go through all that regulation ourselves and piggyback on what they've done for us. Now, here's the cool thing. There has been over 564 banks that have failed since 2001. There's been wow. less than five life insurance companies that have been taken into receivership, and none of those have gone bankrupt. Hmm. And so, and so Nelson talked about we can purchase specially designed policies to kind of become this banker in our own life and, and really allows us to manage our money better because we participate in this kind of this banking model, but through the insurance company. And, and then, like you said, none of the policyholders lost assets. So even in these market downturns, we are in a very... Uh, a very safe, protected position to still manage our own money. And there's a huge difference between what life insurance companies can do and what banks can do. Banks are tapped into the fractional reserve lending. So the saying that loans create deposits for banks is absolutely true. When they loan money out, it actually increases the amount of money they control. Now, we're not going to go into that. That's way too detailed for this podcast. But it's important to know that life insurance companies cannot do that. Mm -hmm. They can only loan out what they actually have, not what they've created by a loan. Yeah. That's, and that's, that's huge. To recognize. And so when we look at these bank failures right now and what happened in 2008, those banks got greedy and they loaned out more, way more, than they had in reserves to back up what they could do or even, um, you know, their tier one or tier two level uh, funds. So that's what Nelson Nash uh, taught us. That's what he saw. That's what he realized when he was caught paying 21, 22, 23% interest on commercial real estate loans. And he says, oh, my goodness, my life insurance can give me a loan between 5 and 8%. What am I doing? Yeah. I was talking to a guy just the other day who um, – who, is, who has a loan that is variable because it's a commercial loan and it's now over 10%. Yes. Oh, and we've spoken about on the last few podcasts because people keep calling in, you know, oh, you know, I've got this loan that's increasing. Um, it was pretty good a couple of years ago, but even yeah. in the last less than 12 months, it's gone up considerably. And so they're looking for other sources. And, you know, we've been teaching people about these concepts that Nelson has been talking about for 16 years now. And so the people that have purchased policies over the last 16 years, they are sitting in a really good financial position. They're really excited yes, they to are. have these access to money at a much lower uh, interest rate. 
where they can control the payments back. And they're really excited that they have these policies that are growing for them. Well, just a couple of days ago, we were in Chicago sharing with one of our clients that's been with us for about 12 years. And uh, he was delighted to go about and show us um, the real estate that he's been able to finance with his policies. And we walked into this one two-story brick building that he re- he's remodeling. And that's where his cash value on his life insurance has purchased that building and is allowing to remodel it. Um, even though the banks are not really interested in loaning money on a bank on a building that isn't productive. Oh, but they will be once he has it up and going and all the renters. That's what he's found with other properties. You know, he gets it up and going and he gets renters in there. He just really does a beautiful job of uh, making things aesthetically pleasing, uh, sound structurally, uh, offering special value to his renters, and then he goes to the bank and they are very excited about uh, taking over that, you know, and and lending money for that. Um, And here's something else, Michelle. I was excited to see all the people that Steve is employing. Oh, yes. In doing this because there's, this is a remodel job. This is huge. And, you know, all the different people that he's improving their economy while he's doing this. It's just exciting to see that what Nelson Nash taught us years ago is really the key to bringing America back to the forefront of being economically sound and being that shining city on a hill that Ronald Reagan used to talk about, Uh, not just financially, but when we do that and interact with our community, it brings a whole community up. And the values that uh, Steve is is passing on to these people that are working for him, that you know, and then his renters. I mean, they uh, have they're getting beautiful awesome to, workplaces. Yes, to work in places to be proud of, and um, he's just building up that community. He has several properties in that community, allowing uh, business opp- uh, opportunities and spaces for a lot of people, and and that was just fun to see. And then you know, he gathered a whole group of his friends. Um, and people that he knows in the community to come meet with us and learn about, uh, you know, how to manage their money better, how to implement the infinite banking concept. And it was exciting to meet with them, and it, it was so fun. They're just all happy faces in the crowd, just wanting to learn and to know how they could improve their own finances. Yeah. And that was exciting. Yeah, and people from all walks of life, from people that teach school to people that, uh, you know, work blue-collar jobs to people that are white-collar workers, everyone was interested in what Steve's doing because... the the age range, too. The age range was... 60s, 20s, you know, all in between. Uh, Because, you know, this... It's providing real value. It's creating real value in the community, and people see that, and they want to be able to to expand on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and these financial principles, it doesn't matter where you are financially, they work. Um, we use, uh, that's why we wrote our book recently, A Biblical Guide to Personal Finance. We implement the truths about finances uh, back, you know, from biblical days, Old Testament scriptures, New Testament scriptures. Time has just gone, gone on, but truths don't change. And yeah. so when we can implement these con- uh, these truths in our own life, it really helps us to uh, manage our money better and to be more uh, productive with the funds that God has placed in our hands. That's right. You, you know, we kind of have a paradox here as we're, we're talking about following the money today. We look at the banks and we see collapse. We see, you know, interest rates increasing. We see people having hard times. At the same time, you know, look at this story. The, this person creating value in their community, and things are going wonderfully mm-hmm. in this area. This reminds me of what Zig Ziglar talks about um, growing up in the Great Depression. He's, he said a lot of people had a very hard time in the Great Depression, and yet there were still people who lived in nice houses that drove nice cars. There, there were people that the recession or the Depression did not affect uh, so much, much yeah. as others. Mm-hmm. And so we we need to pay attention to that and recognize that life goes through cycles. And so we want to prepare in the down in, in the good times for the down times because we know they're going to be just around the corner. It's mm-hmm. just a matter of time. And we're taught that in Scripture. Joseph was uh, elevated to the second in Egypt because he foresaw and was able to inter- 
interpret the dreams God gave the Pharaoh that there were going to be some rough times in the future after there were seven years of plenty. Mm-hmm. And um, so often it's hard for people in the years of plenty to see that it's not just going to continue to get better and better forever and ever, mm-hmm. and there's never going to be a decline. But that's uh, that's impractical and it's um, ignorance of history because there has always been economic cycles where there's ups and downs because that's human nature. Yeah. And what's going to, um, what if we will prepare, like you said, John, in the lean years, I mean, in, in the, the productive years, years, then the lean years will be much more productive for us. Yes. In fact, is oftentimes in those lean years is when we can expand because we have the capital to expand, whereas the banks aren't going to be lending money at that time because they're, uh, you know, suffering their own consequences of poor management. That's right. Now, so often when people experience financial troubles or they're wanting to go to the next level financially, then they they look for advisors to help them get there. Mm-hmm. And there's lots of different types of advisors in the world, and you have to follow the money. Again, <laughs> when it comes yeah. to the advisors, you know, some advisors are compensated based on commission. Some advisors are compensated based on fees. The fee advisors will tell you that they're so much better than the commission advisors and the commission... but. You know, you have to follow the money and understand what's really happening here because, you know, this oftentimes the um, the the fee that a commissioned advisor earns may be better in line with your interest than a fee that would just be charged by a fee based advisor. And so you have to look into the you have to follow the money and figure out how the motives are lining up. And regardless of how somebody is compensated, you can never certify what's in somebody's heart. They're still good. There are good advisors that are compensated one way. There are bad advisors that are compensated uh, both ways as well. And I think here's a good piece of advice straight from Scripture that helps us discern what kind of advisor we should be looking for. Whatever is gained hastily in the beginning will not be blessed in the end. And many advisors want to say how much you can get in such a short period of time for such a little amount. Mm. People now, trying to bypass or to go right to the profit without the sweat equity. That's right. You know, Peter, as he was walking uh, through a city, was approached by someone wanting to buy the power that God had given the, the disciples to cast out demons and heal people. And Peter just turned around to him and said, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. Mm-hmm. And... If we think that we can buy God's blessing, success with money by paying someone, we're setting ourselves up for failure. Yeah. It takes discipline. It takes work. It takes diligence. And if you're not willing to put those into action, then you're probably not going to receive the blessings that you're looking for. Yeah. You have advisors and marketing packages all the time that promise to get you access to inside information, contact with experts, you know, special knowledge in some that some build or other. Sometimes there's a little bit of truth in those programs, things that you can learn in those programs, and yet you you have to consider whether the expense is going to justify uh, that. Absolutely. And I've um, I talked with a guy the other day that. Um, that is working with 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 some advisors or looking to work with some advisors and he has a cash flow problem to begin with and so he's looking to solve this cash flow problem but is spending the cash flow on an education program going to really get him the knowledge he needs to get out of the cash flow program or does he already have the knowledge that he needs is is he looking for a quick solution in another way Mm -hmm. Uh, many times people do have the knowledge they need it's just they just need some help making making the right decisions to get out of a cash flow crunch before they could move to the next level. Well, I remember, Michelle, when we were first starting into this business and how we um, were approached by other um, agents and how they were getting their business plan together and their office structure and they rented an office and they had to paint it a certain way and put up this certain kind of Venetian blind and this type of carpet and have this kind of furniture. And they spent so much time on their office design and all of this that they never sold any life insurance. (laughs) And so we've got to realize that you go and you grow as you're going. Yeah. Um, And life life is like that too. It is. you could. We could never have prepared for eight kids if we had them all. You know. No. If, you know. Yeah, no. It just happened. Yeah, and and you create your life as you go. So 
Um, you know, I think about John, I heard you speaking to someone the other day who's kind of in a financial crunch and you mentioned, you know, you asked him that question, when's the best time to plant a tree? It was mm. 20 years ago. And you know, you, as you have listening on this podcast, I just said that, you know, people who bought their policies, you know, 16 years ago, 15 years ago, 14 years, 12 years ago, they are sitting in a really good financial position. So you might be thinking, oh, you know, if only I had bought a policy 16 years ago. But when is the next best time to plant a tree? It's right now. Yeah. Uh, or when is the next best time to purchase a policy? It's right now because guess what? Time is going to go by anyway, no matter what you do. And so what are things going to look like in another 16 years or in 20 years? We don't know, but it's going to look better if you prepare for that future now. That's and, right. you know, you may not be able to sit under a shade tree right now because you didn't plant it 20 years ago. But if you'll plant it now in 20 years, God willing, if you're still alive in 20 years, you will be able to enjoy that shade of that tree that you plant. And if not, and that tree has grown and flourished, somebody else will be able to sit in that shade. And maybe it'll be some of your family that gets to enjoy the labor of, of you starting now. Yeah. Well, the old saying, the proof is in the pudding is so true. And when we're looking for an advisor, it's often... Uh, uh, to our advantage to say, show me what you personally have done. Yeah. Show me. Let me see your data. Let me see what you've done. Why are you advising me to do such and such? That's something I'm always happy when people ask us, show me your policies. Let me see what you've done. Because we can show you step by step what we've done. And that's then a repeatable process. Mm-hmm. And that's so important to be able to do that because there are people that have um, are just spouting knowledge rather than wisdom. Mm -hmm. There is a difference. Yeah, knowledge is information. And we have more information in today's world than almost ever before available on the internet, searchable um, in, in so many different ways. There's so much information out there that we're flooded with information. And, and, and yet and... wisdom is just as scarce. <laughs> As right. ever, because it, that is knowledge applied I would in a way that is useful. Yes, and John, I would say that we have so much information that there is a lot of information to sort through now. And a lot of disinformation. Now we need to be, yeah. yes, even more discerning because we're so flooded with information. Now we need to sort through it and decide which information is true, which information is usable, which information is applicable. All those things. So more than ever before. Is that really true? More than ever before. More than ever before in my life, I need to be more discerning. And I, I think this is true throughout the ages that everyone faces these things in our lives, situations. Uh, situations could be different, but still we're, we're flooded with discerning the truth and being wise. That's a Thing that everyone faces all the time. And when we go back to solid things that work, truth, biblical principles, then it makes that sorting process easier so that we can be more productive and more prosperous and end up with more wealth in our life. And I have to mention Nathan Steinbach here, Michelle, because when I was 25, Nathan Steinbach, who was in his late 70s, said, Tom, you need to buy whole life insurance. And I said, Nathan, I'm going to buy term because that was the knowledge that I had at that time. And he said, you will be sorry before you turn 65. Well, fortunately, I saw my heir when I was 45 and we bought whole life insurance. Mm. What, if we would have, what if I would have bought that life insurance from Nathan when I was 25? Life would have been so much different for us because of the cash values that that policy would have produced for us. And yet, my knowledge at that time wasn't sufficient enough to make a wise decision hmm. because I, I did not discern the value of what whole life has. Yeah. So you lost 20 years in the process. 
Well, the yeah. best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. And second the second be- best time was at 45. Yeah. <laughs> right. And the second best time is now. That's right. So as we're talking about these banking failures today, there is a lot of, uh, of concern out there, but the, there is still stability in the life insurance world. And this has been the case uh, even during bank failures in the past. There's still security in the life insurance world. Uh, so be sure to check out our video on the perils of banking and how to avoid them. That's going to be coming up. We'll include the resource link here in this podcast. And be sure to check out a biblical guide to personal finance. These are the truths about money that are timeless. And you can order that book by going to wealthtalks.com. And there is also a free downloadable study guide that goes along with the book. So it's pers- it's great for your personal devotions, for a small group that you'd like to get together, or even a large group. We encourage pastors, uh, uh, parents and other leaders to get a copy of this book. Uh, it, not only will it benefit you, but it will benefit the people that are in your life and that you work with searching out the scriptures to implement the, the truths that are shared so that we can better manage our money. That's right. You know, so many people that uh, look to the Bible for finance, um, the, the, the key message seems to be to get out of debt. And yet there's so much more to personal finance than just being out of <laughs> debt and living debt-free. And so, you know, it's, it's talking maybe to a little bit different group of people, but this, this biblical guide to personal finance explores the world of fi- personal finance beyond just getting out of debt. Mm-hmm. Well, from the very beginning, God told uh, uh, Adam, the human race, to reap multiply and replenish. And that includes our money too. And it's really exciting to already see the people that are uh, singing the praises of uh, the biblical guide to personal finance. Uh, We have pastors and lay people that are already saying, this is really cool. So hopefully um, you can reach out and get your copy and share it with uh, your friends, family, got the study guide, bring in and just walk through that study guide with your friends and family. Because if we can help you personally with your economy, and you can help other people in their economy. We can change the economy from going south like it is in the world today. That's right. And remember, as you're going about your life in the world, remember to follow the money. You are listening to Wealth Talks with Themic Fees. Have a wonderful week. <laughs>